you haven't joined the session before, my name is Jenny Griffiths and I work for the Marine Conservation Society. For anyone that hasn't heard of us, we are a marine charity, we work all the way around the UK and essentially we're working towards helping the ocean to be as healthy as it possibly can for the future. And so that involves connecting our teams of scientists with everybody from young people like you guys, all the way through to MPs, retailers, manufacturers, and everybody in between, just to help them know how to be more sustainable and more um, ocean aware in their daily life, essentially. Really, really pleased to have Lauren joining us this morning. Now, Lauren is one of our sea champions. They are our volunteers. They go into schools, amongst other things, and run events for us and do lots and lots of other things. Lauren's also an educator officer for ZSL, the Zoological Society of London at London Zoo. So she's got lots and lots of really, really valuable information to, to share with us. And today's session is going to be looking at climate change and our ocean. So Lauren, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your patience. Apologies for the delay this morning. Um, thank you for joining us. And I will just basically in a moment, I'll be quiet and pass on to you. Just quickly before I do that, there's a couple of buttons I should let you know about at the bottom. They should be at the bottom of your screen if you're on a computer. There's a Q&A button there, so if you've got anything that you want to ask Lauren about her, her role, the work that she does, or the, the, the content that she's talked about today, you can drop into the Q&A session and we can get to that at the end. If you want to get into contact with us or if Lauren asks you a question or anything, you can answer that in the chat box underneath. The only people that will see your chats are myself and Lauren. They won't go to everybody else. They won't be able to see what other people are saying. I think those are the only buttons you need to know about. So I'll put myself back on mute. Lauren, thank you ever so much for joining us. I'll hand over to you. Okay, thank you Jenny and thank you everyone for joining me today. Uh, so we're going to be talking about marine ecosystems and the effects that climate change may have on them. Um, this session is mainly aimed at kind of secondary level, though obviously everyone is welcome to take part if you want to. Make sure you're set up on the chat um, to get involved because I'll be asking some questions as we go through as well. Um, so we're going to just share the screen. Okay, cool. Um, so as I said, we're looking at some marine ecosystems that can be found in the UK. We're going to have a brief overview of climate change as a subject, and then we're going to look at how it's affecting ecosystems that we've already noticed. They're quite big topics, so it's quite hard to kind of fit everything in half an hour. So hopefully this will just give you a brief overview. Um, and if, of course, you have any questions in the meantime, please uh, let me know, pop it into the chat or the Q&A, and I'll try my best to answer them. So my first question to you guys to get us to get the ball rolling is uh, what is an ecosystem? So what comes to mind, if you can pop it in the chat, whatever comes to mind when you think of the word ecosystem, if you can't think of how to describe an ecosystem, can you give me an example of one? Uh, where might we find an ecosystem? The image on the screen might give you a little bit of a clue, um, but I'll give you a few seconds to uh, pop what you think. We can see things are saying a web of food chains and habitats and how creatures work together within them. Fantastic, yeah, pretty much spot on. So we're looking at different habitats and how these organisms or living things uh, interact with each other. Um, an ecosystem also looks at the non-living things as well. So things like for the ocean, the water, or the sand at the bottom or the rocks. It looks at how all of these things kind of interact with each other. Very, very cool. Um, with an ecosystem, usually made up of food webs, which are usually made up of food chains. So we're going to have a look at the kind of simplest uh, form of um, an ecosystem. What makes up an ecosystem of the simplest form? So we're going to look at a uh, food chain from the Scottish Marine uh, habitat. So these are all species that can be found uh, around the coast of Scotland. Um, down at the bottom we have the smallest organism on this list, that's the phytoplankton. I'm sure you've all heard the word plankton before. Plankton just refers to the small organisms that kind of drift along the ocean currents. Um, there's two types, so you could find phytoplankton which is small uh, plants, so single-celled plants and uh, bacteria that float along the ocean. You can also find zooplankton, which is um, basically what makes up the food for the blue whale. Blue whale eats krill. Krill is a tiny, tiny little crustacean that we call plankton as a whole. Because these guys are phytoplankton, they're plant matter, they photosynthesize. 
um, which means they take in carbon dioxide and they release oxygen. And they're actually really important for animals like fish and sharks. They need oxygen to, uh, to survive. They can't breathe air like us. They don't have lungs like us. They have gills instead. So they need oxygen in the water. And the phytoplankton help to create. Um, because they photosynthesize, um, they are what's known as our producers. So on the right hand side here, you can see these different levels. We'll go into them in a bit more detail, but they are what's known as the trophic levels in a food chain. So you might have heard this term before, the trophic levels dictate what level a, a species is at. So our phytoplankton is the producer. In maybe a terrestrial kind of on land food chain, the producers might be things like trees, grass, fruits, nuts, leaves, anything that's sort of produced by taking energy from the sun, uh, that will be on the producer level. So the next step up is our common crab. So the common crab will eat things like phytoplankton, they'll uh, sift it out of the water or they'll pick it, bits of algae and things like that off the rocks. Um, and they are what's known as our primary consumer. They're the first level above the producer. Um, the place will then eat the common crab. So they're our secondary consumer. Then we have our tertiary consumer, the seal. And then we have our orca way at the top uh, as our apex predator. I'm sure you've heard that term before, but apex predator is when um, a species is basically the top of the food chain, the very, very top. They don't have any natural predators um, and they're really well adapted for eating a range of other animals usually as well. So you might, um, on land, you might see things like lions or hyenas. They are apex predators. They don't have any natural predators. In a food chain, so this is a very, very simple food chain, um, you will see the arrows. The arrows will always point from the producer all the way up to the apex predator. Um, this, these arrows are showing you the way the energy is flowing. So the energy from the phytoplankton will, when it's eaten by the crab, will go into the crab. And then the energy from the crab will go into the place. So it's showing you how that energy moves all the way up the food chain. So quite a simple one there. Um, again, if you have any questions, if I'm going too fast, just pop it in the chat and let me know. Um, but this is our simple food chain. I'm going to make it a lot more complicated now um, by turning it into a food web. So, a lot more complicated, a lot more species, a lot more arrows. Um, so you can see we still have those five main species I just mentioned in the middle, um, but now we have a lot more species that are quite interdependent. So the arrows kind of cross over each other. Um, you can see our phytoplankton at the bottom still is now consumed by not just the crab, also the mackerel, the fish on the bottom left. We have the shrimp kind of in between, and the other long arrow points towards a sand eel type of fish. Um, so these four organisms all will feed off phytoplankton and then in turn other animals will feed off them as well. So it's quite chaotic let's say but it kind of gives you an idea of how these species are interlinked, how they kind of feed off different um, species and it can also give you an idea of how some species might be affected if something happens to other species. For example, uh, tuna, so the fish at the top left, that's a tuna. So tuna is quite commonly fished for human consumption. Um, if we were to over harvest tuna, if we were to take tuna completely out of this food chain, um, you can kind of get an idea of what species might be affected. So if we take tuna out, that means the orca will have less options in terms of food and it means that the orca may start to consume more harbour seals, for example. So their population might decrease, which will have an effect on the place population. Place population might boom because they have fewer predators. So it might seem like it's a tiny change in the whole food web, but it's almost like a domino effect. So like if you affect one species, it's likely that the other species will be affected too. Um, something that yeah might look really small, will actually have a devastating effect. And these food webs are very sensitive as well. They're very sensitive to change and one small change can have, like I said, a domino effect. Um, so food chains make up food webs, which make up ecosystems. So that's kind of a quick, brief run through of those. We're now gonna move on to having a little chat about climate change um, in general. 
Uh, so I'm sure you've all heard the, the term climate change before. Um, climate change and global warming are often terms that are kind of interchangeably used or they might get a little bit confused. They might, um, some might think it means the same thing. Um, so I'm just going to quickly go over kind of what the difference is. Um, in terms of climate change, uh, climate is um, the kind of average weather that you see in a place over a long period of time. So um, it's over a long period of time, whereas when you think of weather, weather changes pretty much every day. Like we can look out the window today and see that it's kind of grey. Next week it might be sunny. That doesn't mean um, necessarily that climate change has caused that. That's our natural weather pattern. Climate is looking at the average weather that we see over decades or even longer, if possible. Um, so climate change is something that we're seeing a lot um, in different countries. We might not be experiencing it here in the UK, but in other countries they are. So places that, use, that are used to drought are now experiencing heavy rainfall and flooding. Places that used to experience heavy rainfall are now experiencing drought. Um, I'm sure you all saw the devastating bushfires uh, earlier this year in Australia. Those um, were a result of climate change as well. Um, so it's happening all around the world. Just because it's not affecting us so much um, doesn't mean it's not happening around the world. So um, climate change is basically looking at changing weather patterns and changing um, kind of chaotic weather around the world. That's not what people are used to, people or animals. Um, global warming is looking at the average increase in temperature around the world. So in terms of, I hope I've explained that all right, um, in terms of global warming, we're looking at an increase around the world due to greenhouse gases. Um, can anyone give me an example of a greenhouse gas that you can think of? Um, there are three main ones that uh, I'm thinking of that are usually kind of mentioned in terms of global warming. Um, but if anyone can give me an example, that would be fantastic. We've got methane. Methane, yeah, great one. Methane's one of the main three I'm thinking of. Um, oops. So the other two are um, carbon dioxide and, um, oh, I've lost it, nitrous oxide, I think. Yes, um, so those are the main three. Um, and the way greenhouse gases work is they, uh, they exist in our atmosphere and they kind of create this nice kind of warm bubble. They absorb heat. They're really good at absorbing heat. Um, so if we look at the diagram, uh, when the sun's rays kind of head towards the earth, when they hit the earth's surface, especially on land, the heat is absorbed by the earth. If it hits somewhere like Antarctica, where it's white ice sheets, the heat is most likely to be reflected. So it's reflected back up through the atmosphere into space. With greenhouse gases, what they'll do is they will absorb some of that heat as it goes past. Um, so they're kind of keeping us nice warm bubble around the earth. Um, greenhouse gases, some people think that they're quite a recent thing that's kind of human made, but actually without greenhouse gases, keeping the earth at a steady temperature, um, life on earth as we know it would not exist. So we actually do need greenhouse gases to help us survive. The problem with greenhouse gases is when they get, uh, when there's too much. And that's what we're seeing now. Because of our emissions as a species, um, we're seeing a lot more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and they're absorbing a lot more heat and warming up the earth. Um, and this is a big, big problem. Um, in terms of where um, these greenhouse gases are coming from, so things like carbon dioxide and methane. Does anyone know where gases might be coming from? Can anyone tell me some examples of where we might be letting out carbon dioxide, letting out methane? Any examples at all of where they might be coming from? Transport? Transport, yeah. Um, production? Production. Yeah, absolutely right. So the main kind of areas that we're seeing, um, whoops, these kind of emissions are uh, factories and production, 
um, burning of coal for energy, things like that, a lot of carbon is being released into the atmosphere. Another issue is transport. So think of how many households at the moment have at least one car or at least one vehicle. Um, how often um, families can go abroad on, on holiday on a plane. Um, flights uh, have, are a lot cheaper these days, so it's a lot more accessible to be able to go on holiday. So it's a lot more common. Um, and flights actually release a lot of CO2 as they go. And another big issue is cattle. So cattle release methane. And I think recent um, research has shown there's about 990 million cattle on the earth. And that's a lot of cattle, more than there naturally would be. Um, and they're producing a lot and a lot of methane. And the reason they are there is because of human consumption. So for meat, for milk, um, and for leather and things like that. So these kind of sources are actually producing a lot of our greenhouse gases, which is making our planet on average warmer than it should be. Um, in terms of warmer, it's actually, scientists have estimated that our planet is 1.5 degrees Celsius hotter than it should be. This might not seem, um, you might not feel the difference if you were to feel, you know, 1.5 a difference in temperature, um, but actually a lot of species around the world are adapted to life um, at a certain temperature and even a small change can have a huge impact on them. Um, we're going to look into coral bleaching in a second. Um, I'm sure some of you have heard that term before. Um, also scientists and conservationists have found that um, predators, because in places like Africa, because it's a lot hotter, um, predators can actually hunt for less time in the day. So they're actually not able to eat as much as they used to be able to because it's so hot. Um, so actually that's having an effect on their, you know, bringing up of pups, things like that. Um, the places like, um, even in the UK, there's certain viruses and diseases for amphibians that are actually a lot more deadly, the hotter it gets as well. And the hotter it gets, the less likely animals that are infected are able to survive. So even a 1.5 degree difference is already having a huge impact. And scientists have predicted that if the average temperature was to increase to two degrees, so 0.5 degrees hotter than now, um, they predict that the majority of coral reef systems as we know them will have died out because they are not adapted for life at a two degree increase in temperature. So really sad and really important that we start to kind of work together to mitigate or kind of reduce the impacts of climate change and global warming. Um, so the, a lot of the ice, um, the iceberg that you saw in the previous slide, uh, because of the increase in temperature, it's melting. Um, it's melting in the kind of summer months and then in the winter, less and less of it is refreezing, if that makes sense. So there's more water in the ocean and that is causing a rising sea level. Um, this is, again, you may not notice the difference too much, um, but scientists predict that by uh, 21,000, so in 80 years time, uh, the sea level will have risen by three feet at least. And that's, you know, almost our lifetimes. Um, and that's a huge, huge impact. Um, not just on wildlife, so a lot of wildlife, again, is adapted to life on the coast, so it's ad they're adapted to life in rock pools, uh, on estuaries or marshlands, places like that. They're adapted to live there specifically. They get their food there, they get their shelter there, they can breathe there. Mm. If the sea level is rising, they won't have that um, habitat anymore. They won't be able to survive. And it's down to the species to be able to adapt. And if they can't adapt quick enough, the species will die out. So it's really important to look after them not just for wildlife, but also for humans as well. So a lot of um, humans might lose their way of life if, we, um, if our coastlines are eroded. Um, and even things like holidays, you know, spending time in nature, on the beach, going for a swim in the ocean, that might not be something we can do um, in a hundred years time. And that's something that's, again, we're gonna lose if we don't try and reduce the impact of climate change. Um, another issue that is caused by global warming is coral bleaching, like I mentioned before. Um, we're going to have a quick look at a video um, 
and hopefully this will show on the webinar. Bear with me one second. Okay, so. Yeah, we've got it now. Perfect. Um, so on the left, I think this is there's a year in between these videos. So on the left, we have a coral reef system that is alive and healthy. And then on the right, we have a coral reef after a warm bleaching event. So the sea temperature was too warm for the coral um, and it unfortunately died. The reason the coral loses its color is because it was given to the coral by something called algae. Um, so algae live on the coral. The coral produces, it's rooted in the ground and it has, it makes like a safe haven for the algae. So the algae stick to the coral and the, al the coral then feeds off the algae. So the coral gets food. The algae has somewhere safe to stay um, and they live together, but the algae is quite picky. So when the water gets a bit too warm, um, they will, sorry, bear with me. Let me go back to where we were. Um, when the coral gets too warm, the algae will leave. The algae can leave if they floats off, becomes uh, phytoplankton again, so it drifts in the ocean and the coral can't move, so it stays where it is. And that's what gives it that white colour. Um, and sadly, because the coral can't feed off the algae now, the coral will most likely die. And that's what's happened here in this image. That's what happened in the video we just saw. Um, not only is the coral dying, but also the organisms and wildlife that live within the coral or around the coral also disappear. So I don't know if you remember the difference in two videos, there were lots of fish on the original video. Whereas when you look at the year later, there was a lot less life in that video. Um, so yeah, coral bleaching is a massive issue because they provide such a great habitat for a lot of animals that now when the coral dies, they have to go and find new habitats. So two massive issues caused by global warming. So that's rising sea levels and coral bleaching. Again, two massive subjects and there's so many more issues. I wish I could squeeze into this uh, webinar, um, but it's not all doom and gloom. It's not too late. There are things that we can all do. Um, so I would suggest starting kind of small. That's how we're gonna build up these long-term habits. So I don't expect you all to suddenly um, just turn green overnight and you know everything to prevent climate change. Our lives are just too convenient now. That's the problem. We have cars and we have single-use plastic all designed for our convenience and to change that would be a bit too much. But I'm asking for small changes over a long period of time. So even simple things like turning off the lights when you leave the room. Again, that's going to save carbon emissions, save energy and also save money or save your bill payer money. Um, with appliances, if you turn them off at the wall, um, usually when you turn them off with the remote, they have that little red light on. If you turn them off at the wall, no energy is wasted leaving that little red light on. Again, saves carbon and saves you money. Um, even simple things like can you cycle or walk to work, even if you do it once or twice a week, that can still have a great impact, um, especially if lots of people are doing it as well. Um, Another huge sort of um, contributor to carbon release is uh, single use plastic. I call it single use because it's things like water bottles that are designed for one use only and then designed to be thrown away. Thankfully, a lot of single use products are now uh, recyclable, so we can recycle them. It doesn't have to be single use anymore. Um, but we still want to cut down on the production of bottles in general anyway. So you can invest in a uh, reusable bottle. They're relatively cheap these days and they do last forever. Um, and if you're worried about refilling them, you can look for this logo on the right here, this teardrop shape, water drop. Um, if you see that on the window of a cafe, a restaurant or a pub, that shows you that they are happy to refill your bottle for free. So really good to look out for those. Um, we also have uh, a One Less campaign. So ZSL and the Marine Conservation Society work together um, on this One Less campaign. So we're trying to encourage people to cut down the amount of single-use plastic that they're using. One of the most important things I can suggest is educating yourself as well. So 
spending time, especially if you've got free time over the summer holidays, just have a look on YouTube at some really cool um, marine biologists and conservationists and see what kind of work they're doing. They could show you um, different issues that climate change are having on certain animals. For example, um, on the left here, the top left, we've got Ayana Elizabeth Johnson. She's a really cool marine biologist who's looking at um, sustainable fishing and um, the effects that climate change is having on um, this marine life. Um, she has a really cool TED Talk. So there's a YouTube channel called TED Talks. They do talks by all of these conservationists you can see on the page right now. Um, and also really informative videos like can animals adapt to climate change? So you can learn a lot um, just by going on YouTube and looking up these videos. So I really, really suggest you guys do that. Um, you can also, if you're interested in maybe a career in conservation, you can also um, head online to a website called Instant Wild. And uh, this is where we have a look. You can help directly help conservationists. Um, so conservationists use something called camera traps to help monitor animal populations. So it's really important to um, understand uh, the population of a species that you're trying to protect. And especially if you do it over a long period of time to work out, are they doing well? Are they doing not so well? Or are they staying about the same kind of numbers? Um, this can show conservationists where animals might need help more and which species might need help more. But to do that, they, these camera traps produce a lot of images. So they need your help in identifying species. So I'm going to show or try and show the website. Yeah. So here's the website. Um, you can go online and have a look at crack cam sorry, <laughs> camera trap images um, from directly on the Thames. So on the right hand side here. Um, ZSL is monitoring seal populations in the Thames because seals are such a good indicator of the health of the river in general. Um, so if seal populations are decreasing, then we know that something's wrong. We need to um, investigate. Is it that um, the, the, sorry, <laughs> there's too many fish being fished or harvested from the water? Um, or is it just a bad year for seal pups? Um, we can investigate and see what we can do to help them and make sure the Thames stays nice and healthy. And all you need to do is click on there and then it'll show you the camera trap images from directly on the Thames and you can identify the species. Um, if you're interested, we don't just do the Thames, we do um, in Africa and also Costa Rica as well. They're very cool, something to do if you've got some spare time. Um, very, very cool. So I'm going to go back. Okay, cool. Please let me know if you have any questions. Again, if I'm going too fast, just uh, pop it in the chat. Um, again, if you're interested in conservation, um, you can head online to National Geographic. They have some really cool uh, free conservation courses. So about conservation in general, um, there's also specifics about ocean challenges and solutions here as well. Some of them uh, are longer than others. So some might be three to four hours, some might be a bit longer. Um, depends what kind of time you have and also what interests you. If you're interested in oceans, head over here. Um, there's also the website Future Learn that has a lot of free courses like this ecology and wildlife conservation course here, all completely free. You can sign up whenever you like um, and complete them. Um, they're really, really interesting and help to give you that kind of base knowledge and understanding to see if it's something you might like to take a bit further as well. Oof. I feel like that went very quick, <laughs> um, but that is everything. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please pop them in the chat and Q&A for me. I'll do my best to answer them. That was brilliant, Lon. Thank you so much. As you said, there's so much content that you could talk about for, for many of those of, of, of the things that you've mentioned today. But I think that was a really, really concise and, and easy to follow overview. And I certainly learned a lot from, from listening to you. And I've got a few of my own questions. I've been scrolling away in the background. <laughs> you I can see that there is something in our Q&A. So what kind of um, thing do you do at ZSL? ZSL and what is your favourite marine animal? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, so at ZSL, I'm one of the education officers. So my role is to teach the school groups that come into the zoo. 
So we'll teach kind of biology or natural world based sessions. So it could be about animal adaptations. We do run a session on climate change as well or plastics. Um, we also run some on genetics and we teach a range of ages from like early years all the way up to kind of undergraduate level students that come to the zoo. So every day is quite varied. Um, I also run the zoo academies, so like the practical work experience as well and help um, kids if they want to work with animals or in conservation. Um, my job is to help them get there basically or give them the experience they need. Um, my favourite marine animal is uh, the harbour seal. Um, I just think they're really cute and really they're like dogs in the sea aren't they? So yeah, I really like them. I thought that was really interesting, the project that you just showed. I think I jumped into the chat and said, wow, that's really cool. The, the project looking at seals in the, in the Thames. Mm. Uh, when you first said it was seals in the Thames, I was, I was surprised and thinking, what, what can they be showing us? But obviously the health of, by monitoring the species, you can tell lots about the health of the ocean, which I think is really, really interesting. Um, yeah. For anybody who's kind of local to that area, that's, that's a fascinating um, project to be monitoring and, and getting involved in and seeing what happens. Yeah. How long has that been running? Has it been going for a while? Oh yeah, it's been running for a good few years. I think we've got um, like a good few years kind of bank of information mm. and there is um, a seal count. So um, the conservationists who work on the Thames project, they go out on boats, they go out on a helicopter and they do surveys every year as well to monitor the population. So they're actually a really important part of what we do as an organization um, and yeah it's really helpful to have help in spotting them in the camera traps because as you can imagine there's a lot of images yeah 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 so having other people were able to monitor them would be would be really useful i also i could not believe and this isn't really a question it's more of a statement but to yeah. see the two the, the coral just one year apart side by side. I mean, yeah. obviously I, we, we, you see lots of pictures, don't you, of coal bleaching and obviously lots of pictures of coal in their, in their healthy state. But to, I, I find that a really, really powerful image. So um, mm. or video. thank you for sharing that because it really, really drove home for me just how quickly this can, this can happen. And, and the small changes that can cause that huge impact, um, mm. which is really, really shocking. Um, yeah. Sorry, you carry on. You were going to say something. <laughs> I was just going to say, yeah, a small change in temperature can have that huge effect and affect the whole habitat. Um, yeah, it's crazy. In but, the same way you were saying in the beginning with the food web, if you take, it just seems like a small change. If you take one animal, you know, there's so many animals there. What difference does it make if we take one animal out? Animal out, and actually the knock on the domino effect you described it as, didn't you? Um, mm. and, and the same applies for some, what seems like small changes for us in temperature. Actually, the impacts of that both for the marine world and the terrestrial environment are, are enormous. Mm -hmm. um, one of my one of my in fact my my question was about how you got into you obviously work for the ZSL at the moment. How did you get into being part of conservation and education? What's what's your background? If there are people li listening to this live or indeed watching this on YouTube later on and thinking she's got a really cool job, I, I fancy doing that. What how, what was your route? How did you go about it? My the way I got into it was slightly unconventional. I think um, I. As I was growing up, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I, when I was younger, I knew I had this like passion for like wildlife and really enjoyed spending time in wildlife. But throughout my like education, I kind of tried different things. So I tried, I did an art and design foundation year. Then I changed my mind and did business and French at uni and then changed my mind again. Um, but it was when I started volunteering at the Natural History Museum in London. Um, and I started as a learning volunteer there. Um, where basically we would take specimens from the gallery, excuse me, and we would go out onto gallery and sort of engage with people about them. So I would go out with like a polar bear skull, a replica, not a real one, um, and I would talk to people about them. What Can you guess what animal this is? Let's work it out. Um, and I realised that there's this whole kind of career that I had never heard about before where you could um, teach people about animals um, all day long basically and like every day is a learning opportunity not just for me but for other people and I really enjoy that side of things so I volunteered there then I volunteered at the zoo and I discovered their education department um, and then basically um, tried to get as much experience as possible helping out there um, kept applying for jobs and eventually got through as a seasonal um, back in 2018 then um, got sort of extended 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 and finally got made permanent last December 
I think it was. Um, so basically, um, I think my advice would be to try and get as much practical experience as you possibly can. Um, a lot of places, even if it's not, you know, it doesn't have to be at the zoo, it could be at your local farm, your local cattery. If you have animal hands-on experience, that can really help um, to kind of set you apart from others. Um, I would suggest, looking back at it now, I would suggest an animal-related degree that will definitely help, or animal-related studies. Um, but the practical experience is what's going to set you out the most, because it shows you're really passionate about what you do. Um, and I think I was going to say, a lot of places, they do, um, you can volunteer once a month or once every two weeks. It doesn't have to be a massive time um, commitment, basically. Um, so yeah, that's, that would be my advice to get to where I was. It was a lot of practical experience. I think that applies to a lot of things, doesn't it? Regardless of, and especially in this day and age when people, you know, lots of people go to um, to university and get get qualifications, and maybe they are in the field that they work in, or maybe they maybe they aren't. But actually, it's that experience on your CV that counts for absolutely everything. And actually, when when we're recruiting in roles and we're looking to employ people, it's the experience. So, not that I'm saying don't get your qualifications, people. That is not what I'm saying <laughs> at all. But your experience <laughs> counts and is is really really important as well. And volunteering. Yeah. For different organisations, it is a really awesome way of doing mm. that. Um, and that's what, from what you were saying, that's what helped you to really find what you wanted to do with yeah. those volunteering experiences. And it's also a really good way to show you if it's what you want to do as well. Um, so if you actually turn up and after a few weeks you're like, actually, I'm not enjoying this, that's absolutely fine. Um, and you can spend your time looking at what you're really passionate about. So, yeah, volunteering is really useful. Brilliant advice. I think that's excellent. Um, I can see. Mary's asked, so we talked about you being a sea champion. How did you get into being a sea champion? And is there anything that you're hoping to do as part of that, that volunteer role for it? Oh, good question. Um, I have been a fan um, uh, of the Marine Conservation Society for a good few years. I started off as a member, I think. And then um, I was just trying to get, look online and how to get involved a bit more um, in a charity that works sort of with native wildlife, native habitats. Um, and I looked online and saw that sea champions um, are something that you uh, hire, I guess, is that the right word? Um, volunteers on the website. So I applied through the website, um, had a quick kind of interview over the phone, I think, and then um, became a sea champion. I'm a very new sea champion, so I haven't been able to go out yet and kind of do any education sessions, but that's something I'd be definitely interested in. Um, and helping out in events, but I think because of the current situation, um, that's not possible at the moment. But that's definitely something I'd like to get involved with in the future. Amazing, and it's the the time that our volunteers give to us is so invaluable. We really couldn't do so much of the work that we do, including the session this morning, because you've put all the time and effort into developing and delivering this session. So thank you, thank you so much. Um, there was one more thing that I wanted to say to people before I go and thank Lauren and, and wrap things up. And that is that it is July at the moment, which means that it is Plastic Free July. We are running, Marine Conservation Society are running our Plastic Challenge. So if you want to know more about that, drop onto our website, mcsuk.org forward slash Oh, get your words out forward slash plastic challenge couldn't say that very easily this morning um, and find out what that's all about but in short it is all about reducing your use of single-use plastic normally we try and get people to give up single-use plastic for a day a week or a month during July but obviously we understand that at the moment things are very very different in terms of being able to get shopping and get to places and and all of those things so we're just trying to ask people to do their best to monitor their usage see what they are using and see if there's ways that they can cut that down. There's loads of tips online and lots of other information to get you started. So do check that out because everything we do in any way is helping the health of the ocean. If we, anything that we do will help knock on effects of climate change and pollution it is all a good thing for our environment. So that is the link to what we're doing today. Lauren, thank you so, so much. Um, Really, really appreciated your time. This session will be, it has obviously been recorded and will be hosted on our YouTube channel forever more so that people can join um, and listen to, yeah, listen to your presentation at any point in time. So thank you so much. Really do appreciate it. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Not at all. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, and just one last apology for our technical issues this morning. There, there were a few jumps there. My network is still not particularly secure today. So apologies for that. It is my end that's causing a problem today. So thanks ever so much, guys. We hope you have a great day. There will be some links and bits and pieces that we'll send around to you following this.
for the registered email. Um, but otherwise, we hope to see you again soon. Thanks very much, guys. Take care. Thank you.